I've been asked to do an expository lesson. That probably is one of the better ways to preach. Simple. There's not a man in this audience that could not do it, stand up here and do the very same thing. <clears throat> Leroy Branlow, as you've heard me mention, at least in my class many times, he was a man that I highly admire, even to this day, even though he's dead and has gone to his reward. But he never did use an outline. He never typed out an outline. He never went to a school of preaching. His dad taught him and his grandfather taught him. And when he preached, he preached straight from the Bible. He just simply opened it up and let God's word speak. I don't often preach like that, even though I love it and I enjoy it. The reason I do outlines is because many people want outlines. They share those outlines and things like that, and that's good. But I thoroughly enjoy doing expository preaching. Brother Brownlow, is, he never preached outside of Texas. He started congregations in Fort Worth, Texas, and when they'd get up around 200 to 225, he would leave that congregation and go start another one. I don't know how many congregations he started over the years. He didn't preach as a living. Uh, he was a wealthy man. He, uh, he owned a publishing company, or his dad did, and he, of course, inherited it. But my whole point is this. He was an amazing gospel preacher. He was an amazing preacher in, in many different ways, but he was an amazing Christian as much as anything. I want to share with you this evening Psalm 119. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me and you'll see how powerful God's Word is. In the Psalm of 119, the psalmist is going to talk about, and he is doing prayers here, but also he's handing out praise. He's also talking about his profession of obedience. In 176 verses, you can learn much. Now, we're not going to look at every verse, but I want to show you something that will help us. Everything that we see this evening should encourage us. From 119 of the psalm, in verse 2 in particular, he's going to speak about his heart. And this is where our hearts should be. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Now the word blessed here has the same meaning in the Hebrew as it does in the Greek. It means they're happy. When you find people opening God's word up and studying from it, they're happy. But not only that, but they're happy. Those that keep or observe, there's a literal word here, Observe his testimonies or his commandments. The word of God is powerful, and we all know that. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. We would be wise to prepare ourselves to be able to teach the word of God to others, but also to observe it ourselves. The prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, when Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And so the psalmist here simply is saying that he is going to seek, and we all should seek God with a whole heart. He's also going to talk about, in verse 10, about his prayer to God is, Please don't let me wander. Listen to him. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. This is wonderful to look at. If we had this kind of a spirit, if we were to turn to God and say, With my whole heart do I seek you. Please, God, don't let me wander from your commandments or your teachings or your testimonies or your word. And here's the way we do this. It's actually recorded in verse 24. Because God's word is a counselor. 
As you all know, for the past several years, that's basically all I've done is counsel, marriage, uh, individual counseling, family counseling, uh, drugs, all kinds. But my whole point is this. We understand what a counselor is. A counselor gives you guidance. There's no greater guidance than God's Word. He said in verse 24, Thy testimonies also are my delight and, he says, my counselors. That's important. If we do that, then we can go to the next verse. We'll drop us down to verse 24. I mean, excuse me, to verse uh, uh, 30. When he said, I have chosen the way, that is, the faithful way, I have chosen the way of truth, thy judgments or ordinances or law, thy judgments have I laid before me. And so he says, I have chosen the way of truth. The very thing that Jesus prayed for, this is what he had done many, many, many years before Jesus even came to earth. I wonder how many of us can say to God, I have God, I have chosen the way of truth. And God, your judgments or your, your laws are laid before me. If we do that, then we will be able to also do what the psalmist did in verses 37, 38, and 39 as we continue to go through this chapter. Remember, he says in verse 37, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Vanity. Solomon deals with that quite a, deal, a, a lot in, in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, and quicken, the word quicken just means to revive. And quicken thou me in thy way. Here's a man pleading to God. In this prayer, he's saying, turn my eyes from that which is vanity. Help me, God, not to desire and to look upon things that are vanity. This is important because it helps us to understand what we should do. The next verse says, establish or establish thy word unto thy servant. You know, in James, James tells us to pray for wisdom. And we should. When we do that, then we can understand what he's saying here when he prays that God would establish his word unto his servant. But listen to this, unto your servant who is devoted to thy fear. If you do a word search on fear here, it doesn't mean that he's trembling or he's fearful, but it simply means reverence. If there's one thing that we need today, even in the church, is a tremendous reverence for God and his word. A tremendous reverence. Because if we fail to have a reverence for God and his word, then we're never going to be thinking like the psalmist is here. So establish thy word unto, my, unto thy servant who is devoted to thy word. Turn away, turn away my reproach which I fear. The word fear here again doesn't mean trembling, but he said that means that I dread. I dread those things that come to me. Help me, dear God, to turn away from this. He says, for thy judgments are good. Remember in the book of Numbers, Numbers 32, 23, where there the prophet said, be sure your sins will find you out. Remember how Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, that God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And so when we began to look at this, we can appreciate this prayer. We can appreciate the praise and profession of obedience. We should be a people that are constantly praying. We should be a people who are praising God. Now, to praise God isn't just a verbal thing. Yes, we praise Him through songs. That's verbal. Through prayer, yes. And through speech, yes. But we praise Him also through our lives. As I mentioned this morning from Matthew chapter 5 in verse 16, where Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's a, that's, a, that's a sense of praise, to glorify God. 
Look at verse 40, excuse me, 46. I will speak thy, of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in thy commandments which I have loved. I don't know if you know it or not. I know <clears throat> Greg Smith does. And we have made contact and discussed this through an email. But uh, in the Ukraine, the church in Ukraine is, has been sieged. The Soviet Union, the Russians, have taken over the church there in that area. They've taken over the building. They've seized the building. They didn't even allow the Christians to take everything out of there. And, and this is the truth. And Bear Valley has a school there in this area. And now it, it's, it's just gone that fast. What's my point? My point is, here he said, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings. Now, people that I know over there are telling me that these people, even though, and they were, by the way, they, they came in at gunpoint and they, they ran them out. But to the people that I don't know personally, but I know of and I know people who do know them, and they say they're not leaving. They are not leaving. The only way they will leave is in a casket. That is commitment and that is devotion. And some of these people, by the way, have their families over there. And someone says, well, I would run like crazy. Remember what Jesus said. We need to remember this in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 18. Jesus speaking to his disciples, he said, you will be brought before governors. You'll be brought before kings for my sake. We need to understand, brethren, even in America, this, this may happen to us. If we stay on the road we're on now, if we are showing the kind of weakness that we show now toward God and His Word, and we're not living up to our profession, then we need to realize that it can happen to us. By the way, it's already happening in some states, such as in California, in Wisconsin. These are places where that have been arrested for absolutely having the Bible out. Now, we think not in America, yes, but we need to keep in mind that we are God's children and that we will not back down for any cause or for any reason. Remember how Jesus said in John 14, 15, he said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now, Jesus teaches us, he commands us, to go out into the whole world and preach the gospel to everyone. We're to preach it in love. We're to do it with the right approach, with the right care and the right concern. We're to glorify God in the way we do it. Also, he said in John 15, 14, he said, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Verse 48, My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Absolutely. And think about this. The psalmist said in verse 50, This is my comfort in my affliction. What is his comfort? God's word. God's statutes. His commandments. He says, For thy word hath quickened me. It's revived me, he says. Well, we know from Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, these things are written for time, were written for our learning so that we might have that hope also. And so these are important verses for us. And to be able to go through this, and actually, as I say, I'm skimming over it. But if you were to do a study of all 172 verses of Psalm 119, I believe that it will absolutely change your life. Now, let's go to the next verse. We'll go to verse 60. He said, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Think about it. He was quick and didn't delay at keeping the commandments of God. How could he do that? Well, because he had a love for God. He had a love for God's Word. I remember also in the school of preaching, one of our instructors, uh, Don Simpson, a wonderful man. Uh, unfortunately, this man was uh, 
Um, it's very sad. He was a great man. And uh, he was falsely accused of some things. Uh, he was such a moral man. He reminded me of Jerry Thompson, so meek and gentle. And he would give you the shirt off of his bike. He helped so many guys and gals. He helped so many families. He and his wife and his two children were precious. But he was framed and he was destroyed. He is now in a nursing home. He has lost his mind. But I'll tell you, he used to tell us in school, you want to be happy? Just do not slow down at study and at keeping God's word. Because you're going to face some hard times. Now someone would say, well, it sounds like he didn't do that. He did do that. But when they took him to court and these false accusations were made, he was found guilty. And even after the guilty sentence was given, the parties that were there, two of them which were members of the church, never made it right until they sentenced him. And then they told the judge through not verbalization, but they later went to their lawyer and said, we're wrong in what we did. You can be strong and you can still crumble. Someone can squeeze your head hard enough, doesn't have anything to do with your faith, doesn't have anything to do with your commitments. It's the human side of us. That's why we need to make sure that we do not delay in keeping the commandments of God. Why? Because the commandments of God teaches us, it teaches every single one of us what we should be like, the kind of person we should be, or I say must be. But you know what? Even though I haven't talked to Don, I did talk to someone who had talked to him and even though he is just, he's, he cannot, I mean, he's in a nursing home, he still has his mind to, to a great degree. But here's the verse. Here is the verse that he quoted to this man. It comes out of Psalm 119, verse 71. Here's what Don said. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes, in other words, it's been good for me, God, that you disciplined me. Had God not disciplined Don Simpson over those years, he would not be of the mind, even though he's in a nursing home, he would not have the faith that he still has. And this is something we need to keep in mind. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, discusses the fact that discipline is very hard but he also said, and it's for our benefit, it really is, and that we may share in God's holiness. And so therefore, he says in verse 11, that all discipline seems unpleasant at the time. Of course it does. Yet it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness. What a wonderful man Don is. What a wonderful man the psalmist was. And so we go to verse 80. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes. If there ever was a time for the church, and again, I'm not trying to minimize time, but if there ever was a time when we need to be praying to God and to pray, God, help me. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes. Please. And here's what he said that I be not ashamed. You know, if we're ashamed of God, He's not going to know us on the day of judgment. In Proverbs 23 and 23, the writer tells us to buy or to obtain the truth and sell it not. To get understanding and all of those things. But we must understand that we are to not to sell out on the truth. And he tells us why this is important in verse 86. He explains, all thy commandments are faithful. <clears throat> they persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. 
Let me tell you, I think we all realize where Jesus said back there in Matthew 10, 18, he said, you will be brought before governors and kings and you'll be brought before governors and kings because of me. Because you're a Christian, you're going to be brought before these people. Well, we need to understand, no matter what happens to us, all of God's commandments are faithful. And here's what we need to understand. God's word will never, ever change. Look at verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. I hear some strange things today from some of my brethren, some very strange things. I hear some things that are just outright lies. And if it wasn't so serious, you would have to laugh with pity on such people. But these people know truth. But they've sold out. They've sold out for their own good and to make themselves look good and for themselves to be popular among the masses. We need to be the prayer of, of the prayer that the psalmist had here when he said, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. These are amazing words. We know from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, we need to understand that we are to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. These are wonderful words. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25, Peter himself declared that God's word is everlasting. And it is. And so these, this one chapter can help us so much. Let's move on. In verse 103, here he says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Well, the psalmist in Psalm 3, or excuse me, in Proverbs 3.14, spoke of the word of God as being, uh, when he was talking about the benefits of wisdom there, he spoke about how that this is, this, his word is greater than even gold or fine gold. The psalmist again, back in Psalm 19 and 10, talked about that his words were, were, was Sweeter than honey, sweeter than the honeycomb. Why? Because it feeds our soul. It feeds our soul. And so, no wonder he said, How sweet are thy words unto my taste. And then here's the, the verse that we all know by heart. Psalm 119, verse 105, probably has been quoted as much as any verse in the Bible. When the psalmist said, Thy word is a lamp, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. I wonder how many of us can say that. I wonder how many of us open up that book and let it be a light. Let it be the lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I really wonder these days. Now listen to this. Go down to Psalm, uh, well, to verse 113. He said, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Isn't that amazing? I hate vain thoughts, but God, I love your law. He said, thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. What a profound statement. Listen to that. Thou art my hiding place. In my shield, remember how Jesus would say to Israel as he wept over or Jerusalem, I mean, how he wept over them. And he said, I'm like a mother hen to you. I spread out my wings to comfort you and to protect you. And yet you won't come to me. You just won't come. Well, the psalmist said to God, you're my hiding place. I come to you for comfort. Remember several years ago now, I don't know when it was, many years ago, when St. Mount Helen, I think it was called, how it erupted, destroyed just thousands and thousands and thousands of acres and homes and things like this. But it's a true story how that the forest people were going through after a few days and 
or maybe a day or two, and ashes were still hot in some places, smoke still spewing up. And they came to this bird. It was a dove. And the, the, one of the guys had said, isn't this sad? Look here how that this dove burnt to death. And he simply took the stick that he had and just sort of flipped it. And guess what? There were two baby doves underneath the mother. And they were alive. And they took them and they nourished them. And the birds survived. The mother gave her life for her chicks. Jesus gave his life for his people. And we need to understand this. And so he would say what he said. He, you're my hiding place. I come to you. You're my shield. I hope in your word. And here's something we all should be able to say in verse 120. <clears throat> my flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. What is he saying? I have a tremendous respect for you, God. I have a tremendous respect. I tremble at your word because I know it's truth. But then he would continue in verse 127 and 128 when he talks about it is God's word that provides the only infallible way when he said, therefore I love thy commandments above gold. Yea, above fine gold. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. These are wonderful words. Verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. In other words, it gives knowledge and discretion. It is a guide, as he said in 105. It is a light and a lamp. And then 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Indeed it is. It is indeed. So no wonder we are to buy or to obtain the truth and don't sell out on it. No wonder Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth in John 17, 17. Look at verse 148. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. In other words, my eyes stay open during the night or through the night. <clears throat> I forgot who it was, but I remember in school we went on what they call the restoration tour and someone might say that that's silly, but it was a wonderful thing to go to. We took a week and went up in Kentucky and other places. But anyway, one of those old time preachers would always, he had his own study. He had a rectangular study, windows all the way around it. And he went out every morning at 1 a.m., and from 1 a.m. to 8 a.m., he did nothing but pray and study every day of his life. Every single day. And they said, and of course, said he was one of the most well-liked, the most well-thought-of, highly respected men during that time. As a matter of fact... They had such a story about him, you'd think, well, how do you forget his name? Well, there's so many of them. But I thought to myself as I looked into that building, you couldn't go in it, but you could stand at the door. And there were his books. Guess what? Very few. Probably not over seven or eight books. But the book of all books was his Bible, and it's still lying there. And they found him dead sitting at his desk. And guess where he was studying? Psalm 119. Pretty amazing. Yes, thy word is the truth. It's from beginning. It's everlasting. He said that in verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. You know, Jesus said in John 12, 48, my words will judge you. They are enduring 
In 165, he said, Great peace have they which love thy law. Even David understood those, not only himself, but all of those, they, anyone, whoever it was, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Brethren, we're living in a time when Christians wear their feelings right there, some of them. They will go off on you in a heartbeat. They're just waiting for someone to say or do something. They're just waiting. But the, the psalmist said, Great peace have they which love thy law. And they do. I have never found a Christian yet that doesn't have peace that loves God's law. They have peace. You know why? Because they know that God knows their heart. Well, of course He does. He knows all of our hearts. But listen to me. When no one else can understand me, when no one else wants to understand me, when no one wants to listen to me, guess what? I have peace. Why? Because God understands me. You see, and nothing shall offend them. It's very hard to offend me, and I don't say that in a bragging way. But you see, it's God's Word that has helped me to get where I am today. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will not destroy me. You see, many people have just tried to destroy me just like they have you over the years. In many different and sundry ways, it has been painful. But you know what? You endure them. Why? Because great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend me. You see, those who observe and do, they have nothing to fear. Jesus said, fear not him that can destroy the body, but fear him rather who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. Oftentimes we fear the wrong person or persons. And I want to close with this verse in 172. He said, my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. You see, brethren, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul let the church know, which would include us today, that we are God's hands, we are God's mouth, we're His eyes, we're His ears, we're His feet. God is using us to do His will. And all of God's ways are righteous, every single one of them. And we cannot and will not go wrong when we delight in the law of God. What an amazing chapter. What an amazing study. But it's so simple. And all of God's word is understandable. This evening, if you're not a Christian, you can become one. You become one by being obedient to the gospel. And as I look over this audience this evening, I don't know how many in here are not Christians, but I will tell you, it will be the best day of your life because at that moment that you're going down in this watery grave of baptism and the moment you're brought up, all of your sins are gone. Every single sin you ever committed. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. So when we become obedient to the gospel, our sins are washed away and the Lord adds us to His church. For those of us that are Christians, we're told to confess our faults one to another, pray one for another. He said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, James 5, 16. Have we lost that family touch? Have we forgotten that we're brothers and sisters in Christ? that we are the family of God. And it's okay to say, I need your prayers. I need your encouragement. I need your help, whatever it is. What a beautiful family we belong to because it's God's family.